I'm not going to play out what the story is. But there are other people in this story who have their own ends, who have permissible ends that they've willed and made those ends good. So if the shopkeeper is coincidentally bringing about an end that has been made good by someone else, great. We wouldn't say he's a good person. We wouldn't say he's morally praiseworthy. But what he did was bring about a good outcome, a good state of affairs, an outcome, a state of affairs, an object, an end that's made good by someone else. Because there's no naturalistically describable state of I mean, maybe it's easier to see in the opposite case, right? So he wants, so maybe, so take the case where he acts on a clearly a bad match, one where he rips off someone else. He takes that end to be good. He takes that end to be worthwhile. You and I assert that it's not, he's mistaken about it, but why not? Why didn't his will make that end good? Well, because it's interfered with someone else's making their ends good, right? So being ripped off, uh, so his ripping someone else off, conflicts with the end that somebody else has not to be ripped off. And so we now have to figure out which one of those actually is making their end objectively good. Only one of those, he claims, could truly be universal. That's how we tell which of those conflicting ends actually is good. So there's always going to be, maybe, maybe I shouldn't quite say it that way. Um, so for Kant, um, we're not, or at least one person at a moment, is not the only will in town. Yeah. Um, so for Kant, the best state of affairs is that in which good max the fulfillment of universal realizable maxims is maximized. Is that the best way to do this? Um, so for Kant, the, the, the way Kant would say it is that the highest good is when we both act on proper maxims, so we have good wills, and our ends are achieved. So whatever state of affairs brings the most of that is the best of the yeah, Well, look, but, but there are two different things going on here. One is whether there's a good will. The other is whether the ends that a good will wills are achieved. So they're not symmetrical. One's the condition for the other. So um, he's absolutely not going to allow, so, sorry, so when you maximize two things, there are going to be trade-offs between the two. And he's absolutely not going to allow an increase in happiness at the cost of a decrease in good wills, so to speak. Having a good will is the condition for happiness being good. So. The highest good is when there are good wills that also achieve their ends. I don't, I don't, I don't quite like the maximizing of two different things at the same time. But I don't really like that formulation. Okay, um, on to the. Example, the example of a false promise. Okay, so we finally see what's serve as the basis for objective value, uh, and we're trying to illustrate how a maxim might not possibly serve as the basis for 
but you have an objective value. Right? So we're looking at an example of a bad maxim, one which, if willed upon, if the basis for willing, could not possibly make its object, its end, good. Because it couldn't be universalized. Okay, and here's the example. It says, um, let the question be, for example, may I not, when I am in trouble, make a promise with the intention not to keep it? Okay, so making a false promise. Um, Kant is, as usual, kind of loosey-goosey here about the exact specification of the maxim, but um, the, uh, the end, the, let's say the action here is making a false promise because doing so would make me rich, because doing so would lead to better satisfaction of my desires, because I'm inclined to do it, whatever. Okay. So, um, and so his example here is make a promise of intention not to keep it. Um, like I find myself in a financial bind by making a false promise, I could get myself out of that financial line. I, I, I owe money, so I say to you, if you loan me the money that I need to pay back somebody else, I promise I will pay you back. But I have an intention to keep that promise. That's supposed to be the example. Okay. Um, here he says, I easily discern the different meanings of the question can ha I have. Um, that is, may I not do this? Here are the two different uh, senses that I may, may be asking about. Um, two different senses of the question I have. First, whether it, it is prudent to make that promise, or whether it conforms with duty to make such a false promise. Is it consistent with duty to do this? He says, the former, that is, whether it's prudent to make a false promise, the former can no doubt quite often be the take place. So sometimes the best way to satisfy my financial needs or my desires or whatever, my financial interests, may be to make a false promise. I do see very well that it's not enough to extricate myself from the present predicament by means of the sub subterfuge. In other words, I have to think, in order to decide whether it's prudent for me to do this, I can't just think about my short-term interest. Right? At this moment, you'll give me money. That's good. That's not enough to see to decide whether it's prudent for me to do this. Uh, but that it requires careful deliberation whether this lie may not later give rise to much greater inconveniences for me than those from which I am now liberating myself. And since with all my supposed cunning of the consequences, cannot be so easily foreseen that trust once lost might not be far more disadvantageous to me than any ill that I now need, now need to avoid. So sometimes, making a false promise may be a way to satisfy your inclinations, um, but this is not going to be so obvious. The exact calculation about whether your interest will be served by this uh, depends on anticipating all the possible consequences, which is difficult. And so if I make a false promise to you, I have to decide what the chances are that in the future I'll need something from you again, and you won't then believe my promise, and that might not be in my self-interest. It's hard to figure this out. It's not at all obvious. Kant is willing to agree that um, sometimes uh, it may, but it may be prudent to make a, a false promise. But it's going to be hard to decide. But in contrast, he thinks, to all this difficulty of anticipating all the possible consequences for myself, in, which is what I have to do in answering the question is prudent, in contrast to all that, it's clear that it violates my duty, whether or not it is in my self-interest. Um, to be truthful from duty is something quite different uh, from being truthful from dread of adverse consequences. 
Um, as in the first case, the concept of the action in itself already contains a law for me, whereas in the second, I must first look around elsewhere to see what effects on me this might involve, the, deciding whether it's going to be prudent. I have to carefully consider all the possible consequences. But to determine whether it's morally permissible, that's easy. For if I deviate from the principle of duty, this is quite certainly evil by itself. But if I detect from my maxim uh, prudence, sorry, if I defect from my maxim of prudence, that can sometimes be very advantageous to me, though it is, of course, safer to adhere to it. Okay. Um, okay, sorry. However, continuing, this is at 403. However, to instruct myself, in the very quickest and yet undeceptive way with regard to responding to this problem, namely, whether a line promise conforms with duty, I ask myself, he says here, would I actually be content that my maxim to extricate myself from a predicament by means of an untruthful promise, whether this maxim should hold as a universal law, he adds, for myself as well as for others? And would I be able to say to myself, Everyone may make an untruthful promise when he finds himself in a predicament from which he can extricate himself in no other way. His claim now is, um, I could indeed will the lie. So it is, look, it is possible for people to lie. Kant's not denying that. It is possible for people to act on this lying maximum, this maximum making a false promise. Should I say that again? Kant thinks that it is possible for someone to lie, for someone to act on these facts. But what's not possible, but by no means, could I will a universal law to lie. For according to such a law, there would actually be no promises at all, since it would be futile to pretend my will to others with regard to my future actions, who would not believe this pretense. Or if they did rationally so, they would pay me back in like and hence my maxim, as soon as it was were made a universal law, would have to destroy itself. So, um, I ask, I could, I say, I could indeed will the lie, but by no means a universal law to lie. Um, so this is the first example of trying to apply this universalizability test the categorical imperative to a maxim. Um, and the first formulation here, I don't like very much. He says, um, would I actually be content that my maxim is universalized? That makes it seem as though the question that we're asking is whether I would like it to be universalized. And that's not what Kant is asking. What Kant is asking is whether I could will it to be a universal law. Whether I could will that everyone act on the basis of this maxim, myself and everyone else. And his claim here is that I can't. That this maxim is a bad maxim, an impermissible maxim, a maxim which doesn't actually make its end good, even though it may appear good to somebody who because it could not be universalized. It could not be universally willed. Um, so the question here I want to emphasize for Kant is not whether I would like it to be universalized, but whether I can, whether it's possible to will it to be universalized. Okay. And the claim here is that this one can't be. I can't will it to be a universal law. I can't will it that everyone should act on the same axiom. Let me emphasize one more time that somebody still could act on that axiom. Somebody still could will that end for that incentive. What they can't